uh, a real driving force and I guess you could say the poster girl, poster woman, for uh, the, great, the Green Path North fight with the California, the first version of the California Desert Coalition. Um, that's when I first met her and uh, was so impressed by her knowledge and her drive um, and her dedication to the environmental causes. She's worked with the National Park Service, with the Wildlands Conservancy, uh, with the Conservation Lands Foundation, and has been a She's been on the news a fair amount. Uh, she was a liaison uh, working with Diane Feinstein on the uh, work towards getting the national monuments, the three desert national monuments that we're so proud of and happy to have in our world. Um, so I will just uh, stop there and introduce April to talk to us about the protecting the Bodie Hills. April. Thank you. All right, so um, in our uh, keeping with the flow here and the themes, we're going to have another CEQA example, but it's going to take a little minute to kind of set that stage. So, um, I just want to talk about this area that is, to us, the Bodie Hills. It is located in the Eastern Sierra, north of Mono Lake, and it is a landscape that essentially connects the Sierra Scarpin and the very steep Sierra Escarpment to the Great Basin Desert and the Mojave Desert. So it's a transition zone landscape, lots of ecological diversity, lots of tourism. It's known by many and um, loved by many. And the Bodie Hills is an area that's been a little more off the radar than the Eastern Sierra in general because it doesn't have any protection other than the notoriety of Bodie State Historic Park, which many folks have been to as the most um, preserved in Arrested Decay, good old uh, mining ghost town in America. So this area has been proposed for some additional protections um, for many years from both communities and nonprofits and various stakeholders. And the chosen designation will be something kind of middle road conservation, such as a national monument. So this has been a campaign for a long time. Many of you may be familiar with it already. This is a rough kind of ecological boundary of the Bodie Hills. So Mona Lake would be just off the screen, and the next map will show a little more detail. Highway 395 is running along kind of the left side of the screen there, just to the east of that black boundary. So just to set the context. And then you can see that the Nevada-California state line goes through a portion of the Bodie Hills. So again, another example where we're going to have one set of rules on one side of that line, one set of rules on the other side of that line. Animals and plants don't care, but that's the infrastructure um, and the framework that we're all dealing with. So this is another map that the Bodie Hills Conservation Partnership created. You can see Mono Lake just, again, on the bottom part of the screen, right in here. And then this is a highway um, that goes out to Hawthorne, Nevada. These three areas are the remaining wilderness study areas um, in, in the Bodie Hills. This is Highway 395. This is the town of Bridgeport, the Bridgeport Reservoir, and then that California-Nevada boundary. So this yellowish color on the map, kind of tannish yellow, is representative of management and ownership by the Bureau of Land Management. The greenish is U.S. Forest Service. And then we have some white that may be hard to see, but that's going to represent private and holdings. And for those of you familiar with Bodie State Park, that bluish color is Bodie State Historic Park. So to give you just a little bit of context of the ownership and the size here, we're looking at about 350 to 450,000 acres if you count the Nevada portion of Bodie Hills or not, which for our CEQA discussion will not be applicable. Um, and then Bodie State Historic Park is just a little postage stamp on that big landscape. And that's the only thing that's really protected. So there's a little um, zoom in version of where we're going to be talking about for this story. So you notice this parcel right here is a private inholding, and that's where the story is going to begin. So basically, in August, we learned that there was um, a new proposal from a Canadian gold mining company known as Radius Gold to do a mining exploration project in the Bodie Hills. And that was the first snapshot I saw. 
And then as I looked at their proposal, I figured out that it was on that parcel that we just looked at on the map. And it turns out that that parcel has split estate ownership. So the surface rights are owned by a private landowner, in this case a rancher. The subsurface mineral rights are owned by the state of California under the State Lands Commission Authority. So this creates a pretty complex framework in trying to figure out which agencies and individuals are going to have authority and have a role in deciding if this project goes forward. So one of the first things to do was to start mapping out how this process is going to work and where there are thresholds for citizens, stakeholders, NGOs, etc. to engage. So we knew right away that this was not going to be a National Environmental Policy Act, a NEPA process, that there was going to certainly be some CEQA, um, California Environmental Quality Act, and where we still stand is um, where we're going to go next, but I wanted to dive into this example because it's a great example of, as citizens, when you're learning about a new proposal for the first time, how um, it can be important to identify stakeholders, agencies, decision makers right up front. And so, in this particular case, because the State Lands Commission, uh, we learned, does not like to be the lady, lead agency on something like a new mining proposal, they like to defer to the county that has jurisdiction or that ha um, the project is proposed in. So in this case, that's Mono County. Um, but Mono County has never run a CEQA process for a mining project. So that gets back to um, what JP and others have um, identified, Tim, that they will be hiring a consultant, for sure, um, because they have not done this. Never. Um, well, they, they, they started to a couple of times, but yeah, it never went forward. <laughs> the company dropped out in the past. So, um, technically a lead agency has not yet been formally identified, but it is likely to be Mono County, and the State Lands Commission will be um, a participating in, uh, agency. So one of the first things, um, and, and these are some identified next steps, again, is to map out the process the best we can, and knowing that in this case, some, some decisions haven't been made that are quite critical, there's a couple possibilities, right? So that means we have a few flowcharts in action still of how this could run. We also want to identify all the potential stakeholders and decision makers and folks that are going to be important in this process and start outreach to those groups immediately. So that's already happened. There's some examples here on the screen, Mono County, State Lands Commission, um, tribes, you know, landowner of, this, of the surface rights, water agencies, et cetera, et cetera. So getting back to CEQA, um, well, a couple more updates. There's been just a couple of very initial public meetings that the county has had through one of their staff subcommittees. Um, and they have just discussed the application and sort of what still needs to be understood or clarified. Um, so in terms of next steps, once a lead agency is identified, and this is likely to be Mono County, um, we would pretty much then have a staff report um, being developed as they started to understand what's still known, unknown, what needs to be determined. They will hire a consultant. That consultant will then start taking those staff notes um, about the sort of project, and then you know we will kick off the formal environmental process. So there has not yet been any determination if it'll be an environmental impact report, an EIR versus a NAGDAC or litigated NAGDAC, all of that is still to be determined. So we're still in the early process here. But um, in terms of thinking about CEQA, some of the things that we know we need to capture now are what are going to be the cumulative impacts. So Tim raised this, JP raised a little bit. This is going to be a really important component of this particular project for a couple of reasons. So one, this is again an inholding within a larger federal um, owned area. And so access is going to be complicated. The access is going to come from federal lands. So we're going to have BLM and Forest Service partners and tribes um, all discussing and weighing in on that. Um, we know that there's going to be um, potential community impacts, commu potential watershed impacts. There's endangered species, both on the parcel and adjacent to the parcel. There are also by state sage grouse, which are being petitioned for listing right now um, all over the region. This is their 
sort of preferred stronghold population area. Um, so we know there's going to be impacts there. There's many identified cultural resources and, and um, tribal artifacts that are going to be um, potentially impacted. So at this stage, we're making that kind of list of like, what are the things that we need to capture that could be impacted? Who are the stakeholders? How do we engage in the process? Right? So, and that's the end of my slides. Um, <laughs> so a couple more things that I just want to point out. Um, and this is where it's a good opportunity again for citizens to, to think about these types of projects. Because as many of you remember when we were looking at the Green Path North LADWP proposal, you want to get ahead of this process as much as possible. And the agency and the project proponent wants you to wait for that official notice of intent, notice of preparation, EIR, draft EIR, whatever stage they're in, they want you to wait for the next one, right? So you want to organize early, quickly, robust. Um, yeah, so we are encouraging folks to learn about and engage in projects like this before they actually get to a formal process where we have public hearings and public testimony and all those sorts of things, right? Because at that point, the company has their heels dug further in. They've spent a lot more money. Everybody has hired consultants and experts. And this is just a lot more complex process and harder to stop, influence, shut down, etc. So this is a perfect example of although there's still a lot of unknowns, and companies and agencies, even the county, is going to be saying, wait, 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 don't worry. You know, we're, there's not time for you to engage yet. You don't need to comment. That's 100% incorrect. Um, if you want to influence a project, as you've heard some of the tools today, CEQA being one of them, you have to engage early and often. And the first step in that is, again, to find out as much as you can about the proposal, and then to start asking questions. Because many of those questions, they don't want to answer yet. And the more information you can get up front before things become published and on the record, and they start building that administrative record, the better. And I'm sure some of our other speakers will have more comments on that later. But um, we have another example that's going to come up next here from Steve Bardwell on the county general plan. But this is one that's, like I said, a little more complex, but a good example of where CEQA and other um, federal processes and, and local accounting processes will all be used together. And we want to make this as complicated as possible. So there is another component of this where this particular company has two projects proposed in Nevada, which will not use CEQA, but they will, they're going through a National Environmental Policy Act process. But we want those also assessed as cumulative impacts. And we want those to be included in the consideration of this project that will go through CEQA. And that could result in a federal connected action, not likely, but it's possible. And so again, trying to get as much information about these proposals and see if they are connected to other things is really important. So we wanted to give this example as something that um, is applicable to a different type of sort of proposal, but um, that is a good example of why we all need to pay attention to various announcements that you think maybe is not something that um, is going to be a concern in your community, but could be connected in a lot of other ways. So thanks for your time, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Lorraine.